All right. Welcome back to Honors English 2. Today we're going to be working through the last scene of Act 1. Um, it's a really short scene, like maybe six pages, uh, but it's kind of... I always really like it because I think it shows you kind of where the conspiracy really lies in all of this. So in the first scene, we get to we get to see kind of the two sides of the Roman reaction to Caesar showing up. And then, so the good and the bad. And then in the next scene, we get to meet Caesar, who comes across a little, like, full of himself. And then we get to see, like, Brutus and Cassius really don't want Caesar to be king, even though they're his friends. Um, and, but Brutus is like, it is what it is. And Cassius is more like, I hate that guy. Um, and so Cassius basically works to kind of move Brutus against Caesar. And, and Brutus picks up on it pretty quick to his credit. And so he tells him, he's like, you know, what, what dangers would you steer me into Cassius? And eventually Cassius is like, I need to get this guy on my side. Um, because it's really important that I do that. So today we're going to be reading scene three and the scene three opens up with this like huge, terrible tempest. And a tempest is a, a really terrible storm. If you're not familiar with the language and it's like, raining cats and dogs in Rome. Um, it's like, I think one of the characters even implies like the gods are so mad right now. And so um, I'll be curious to see what you guys kind of think of this, but Romans are incredibly superstitious. We see this play out with Caesar. We see this play out in this scene and in future scenes. Um, and in fact, one of the big things we're going to see here is um, there's multiple really strange things kind of happening around Rome. Um, and each one is going to be kind of almost taken as like a portentous sign. Um, and that's portentous, P-O-R-T, uh, port. Um, but the idea is that they're all kind of like bad omens. Right. And so we'll kind of see how each character interprets those experiences. Um, don't mind my background, by the way. I know I've got a lot of stuff. I'm making masks for um, my sister's hospital. So just ignore all the scraps and stuff and whatnot. All right. So um, scene three, enter, uh, we're going to switch scenes real quick and I'll get this pulled up. So scene three is uh, Julius Caesar, uh, scene three, thunder and lightning, enter Casca and Cicero. And so Cicero is another conspirator and he says, good evening, Casca, brought you Caesar home. Why are you breathless? Why stare you so? And uh, Casca says, are you not moved by the sway of the earth that shakes like a thing unfirmed? Oh, Cicero, I have seen tempests with scolding winds that have rived nutty oaks and I've seen the ambitious sea swell and rage. Think of this language, swell and rage, like the world is mad to be exalted, threatening clouds, never till tonight. Never till now did I go through the tempest dropping fire. He says it's raining fire in Rome. Um or else the world is too saucy with the gods and senses or brings them to send destruction. He's like, the world is literally like the gods are so angry um, that they're just, they want to destroy Rome, but they don't know why he's like, and this is like, why saw you anything more wonderful? And Casca says a common. So, and so he's going to ask him like, well, have you seen anything else? And Casca is going to go on kind of this like tangent about all these weird things he's seen in Rome. He says a common slave, you would know him well by sight, held up his left hand, which did flame and burn like 20 torches joined. And yet his hand, not sensible of fire remained on scorched. So he saw a guy with his hand on fire. Besides, I had not since put up my sword against the capital. I met a lion. He sees a lion while he's just out and about who gazed upon me and went surly by without annoying me. And then they were drawn upon a heap of hundred ghastly women transformed by fear who swore they saw men in fire walk up and down the street. So he's like, I saw a hundred women reacting to men being on fire. And yesterday a bird of night, an owl, did sit even at noonday upon the marketplace, hooting and shrieking all these prodigies. When, when these prodigies do so conjointly meet. Let not men say, these are the reasons they are natural, for I believe these are portentous signs unto the climate they point upon. So he's saying like, all of these bad omens are really a reflection upon the conspiracy. Like maybe they shouldn't uh, plot against Caesar because he thinks that these are all bad signs because of the plot. And Cicero says, indeed, it's a strange disposed time, but men make us true things after the fashion theme from the purpose that things themselves come Caesar to the capital tomorrow. And so Cicero's like, you know, it's it's not uncommon to, to interpret some of this in a way that it, maybe it isn't meant to be. All right. 
Um, and so Cicero says, indeed, it is, uh, uh, he doth, Casca says, he doth, for he bid Antonius send word to you that he would be here tomorrow. Um, Cicero says, good night then, Casca, this disturbance guy is not to walk in. Farewell, Cicero. Cicero leaves. Um, now Cassius, our snake in the grass, shows up and he says, who's there? And Casca says, a Roman. And Ca Cassius goes, Casca, by your voice. And Casca says, your ear is good, Cassius. What night is it? Cassius says, it's a very pleasing night to honest men. He's like, no, no, no. So Casca sees all of these things as bad omens against the conspiracy, but Cassius is actually going to kind of flip that. He sees them as good omens. He says, he's like, it's a pleasing night to honest men. He's like, I, you know, whatever he sees is apparently for their conspiracy, not against it. Um, and Casca says, whoever knew the heavens menace so, and Cassius says, those that have known the earth so full of faults. For my part, I have walked about the streets, submitting me into a perilous night. And thus, unabrased Casca, as you see, have bared my bosom to the thunderstone. And when the cross blue lightning seemed to open the breast of heaven, I did present myself even to the aim and very flashing of it. He's like, you know, if if, if these were meant to strike me down, I I opened my my doublet and allowed and and invited the uh, lightning to strike me in the chest. Everybody's so dramatic in this play. And Casca says, but wherefore did you so much tempt the heavens? It is the part of men to fear and tremble when the most mighty gods by tokens send such dreadful heralds to astonish us. And Casca's like, these are bad signs. Like, why are you tempting the heavens? And Cassius is going to flip it. He's going to tell Casca. He says, you are dull, Casca. And those sparks of life that should be in a Roman, you do want, or else you use not. You look pale and gaze and put on fear and cast yourself in wonder to see the strange impatience of the heavens. But if you would consider the true cause, why all these fires, all, he's like, all these fires, all these gliding ghosts, these birds and beasts from quality and kind, why these old men and fools and children calculate, why all these things change from the ordinance, their natures and performed faculties to a monstrous quality, why you shall find that heaven hath infused them with these spirits to make them instruments of fear and warning under some monstrous state. Now, could I cast a name to thee a man most like this dreadful night that thunders, lightens, opens graves, roars, is doth a lion in the capital? A man no mightier than myself or me in personal action, yet prodigious grown and fearful as these strange interruptions are. And Cassius goes, is to cease that you mean, is it not? So Cassius thinks that the way that things are going, people being on fire, lions in the marketplace, owls out at noon, are really signs of Caesar potentially taking uh, charge of Rome. He thinks that they are uh, responses by nature to this man taking power. And Cassius says, let it be who it is, for Romans now have thews and limbs like ancestors. But woe the while, our father's minds are dead, and they, we are governed with our mother's spirits. Our yoke and sufferance show us womanish. So Cassius is like, we're weak. Um, remember, this is a 500-year-old play, so being like a woman is to be weak. Um, and Casca says, indeed, they say to the senators, tomorrow we need to establish Caesar as king, and he shall wear his crown by sea and land in every place here save Italy. Um, I know where I will, and then, so, so Casca's like, yeah, they say tomorrow they're going to make Caesar king. And so Cassius is like, well, then this is definitely not a good sign. And Cassius gets real dramatic real quick. He says, I know where I will wear this dagger then. Cassius from bondage will deliver Cassius. One of the big things we see kind of come up a lot is this idea that Caesar in Cassius's mind and even Brutus's mind is this idea that he'll be a tyrant and that he will treat them all like slaves. And so we see that language come up a lot. So, so he says Cassius from bondage or Cassius from slavery will deliver Cassius. And there in you gods, you make the weak most strong. There in you gods, you tyrants do defeat. He's like, I will defeat this tyrant. I will kill him. Um, nor stony tower, nor walls of beaten brass, nor airless dungeon, nor strong links of iron can be retented to the strength of spirit. But life being weary of these worldly bars never lacks power to dismiss itself. If I know this, know the world besides myself. The part of tyranny that I do bear, I shall shake off at pleasure. It's like, I will kill him, and I have no problems doing that. There's still thunder. Uh, Casca says, so can I. So every bondman in his own hand bears, bears the power to cancel his captivity. He's like, so all slaves have the ability to end their slavery. So he's, he agrees with Cassius here. He's like, okay, you got me. Um, Cassius says, and why should Caesar be a tyrant then? Poor man, I know he would not be a wolf, but when he sees the Roman, are, Romans are but sheep. So he compares Caesar to a wolf and that the Romans themselves are sheep, that they're falling for it. Um, he were no lion, were not Romans hinds. Those that ha with haste will make a mighty fire, begin it with weak straws. What trash is Rome? What rubbish? What awful when it serves for the base matter to illuminate something, a thing such as vile, so vile as Caesar? 
But, O oh grief, where hast thou led me? I perhaps speak this before a willing bondman, but I know my answer must be made, but I am armed, and dangers are indifferent to me. And so he brings up this idea. He's like, I hope I'm speaking to somebody that's on my side. He's like, I am armed. I'm ready to kill. And the fact that I may die is of no concern to me. And Casca says, you speak to Casca to such a man that has no fleeting, t- fleering tale tell. He's like, I'm no, I'm no snitch. My hand, they shake hands. Be facetious. Be facetious for redress of all these griefs. And I will set this foot of mine as far as who goes farthest. And Cassius is like, that's a bargain made. Now know you, Casca, I move, I have moved already some of the certain my noblest minds in Rome to undergo with me an enterprise of honorable, dangerous consequence. And I do know by this stay for the night for me the, in Pompey's porch, for now this fearful night there is no stir or walking in the streets and in complexion of the element in favors like that we have work in the hand, most bloody, fiery, and most terrible. So Cassius has already worked his like sneaky self into the minds of some of the other people in Rome. And so he's got like a, a posse that's willing to kill Caesar too. So enter a man named Cinna, who's another conspirator. And he says, Casca says, stand close well, for here comes one in haste. Cassius says to Cinna, I know him by his gate. He is a friend. Cinna, where haste you so? And Cinna says, to find out you, who's that? Metellus Simber. And Cassius says, no, it is Casca, one in corporate to our intent, our intents. Am I not stayed for Cinna? Cinna says, I am glad to it. The fearful night is this. There's, there's two or three of us that have seen strange sights. Cassius says, am I not stayed for? Tell me, Senna. Yes, you are. Oh, Cassius, if you could but win the noble Brutus to our party. He's like, you need to get Brutus on our side. He's like, it's really important. That's how, that's how well liked Brutus is. They're like, we need to get him on our side. And Cassius says, Cassius hands in the papers, be you content, good Senna. So these papers are those letters that were talked about in the last scene in which Cassius was going to write a bunch of letters, but in different hands and then throw them into like Brutus's like window. Um, if he had a locker, it would be his locker and basically try to persuade him to join their cause and remind him how great he is. Be you content, good Cinna, take this paper and look, you lay it at the praetor, praetor's chair where Brutus may find it and throw this in his window and set this up with wax upon old Brutus's statue. All this done, repair head to Pompey's porch where you shall find us. Is Decius Brutus and Trebonius there? Cinna says, all but Metellus Simber, and he's gone to see your house. Well, I will hie and so bestow these papers as you bade me. He's like, I'll go do what I ask. Cassius says, and then says, repair or head back to Pompey's theater. So they're going to all meet up again later. So Cinna leaves, and he says, come, Casca, you and I will yet air the day. See Brutus at his house. Three parts of him is ours already. So he's like, three of the four, three quarters of Brutus is on our side already. Um, is ours already. The man entire upon the next encounter yields to Mars. He's like, if we can just talk to him one more time, we will get him to our side. And Casca says, oh, he sits high in the people's hearts, and that which would appear offense in us, his countenance like richest alchemy, will change to virtue and worthiness. So he's like, there's something about Brutus that if he were to be one to this this cause, he would change the feel of the entire cause to positive. So right now it looks it looks bad, it looks sneaky, it looks negative. But if they can get Brutus with them, it may not look so bad. And because he's he's so well loved and Cassius says him and his worth are a great need of him. He will write conceited. Let us go for it is after midnight in their day. We will wake him and be sure of him. All right. And so that sets us up for the next scene. Um, scene two is going to the beginning of act two. Um, scene one is, I believe, them meeting up at Bruce, Brutus's orchard. Um, so like all the guys that we just saw in this last scene are going to like make their way over to Brutus's house and try to convince him to join the conspiracy. I already have those videos filmed though, so I will be posting those alongside this one. All right. If you have any questions at all, I'll be online from 12 to 2 tomorrow to help out. Um, and you are always welcome to text me. Okay. So have a great day, guys, and I will see you later.